countries where you're coming from. It's wonderful to uh, to see you all here. Um, let's uh, let's get started. So um, I started uh, this um, thought, thinking about this talk uh, when I saw a talk by the uh, Sugata Mitra. Uh, now I don't know if anybody's heard of Sugata Mitra. He won a a prize with TED, and basically what he did was he put uh, computers in I villages in India, and apparently the kids kind of gathered around these computers and started teaching themselves stuff. And he's taken this further, and in this talk, what he was suggesting was that basically all we really needed for education were good questions and the internet, which uh, for me, well, I, I didn't entirely agree because it seemed to uh, just do away with the need for teachers at all. But it did make me think about, well, what are good questions? You know, why uh, do, do we ask questions in the class? Can we get better at doing them? Uh, you know, what are the principles behind uh, the, the questions that we ask. So just as a quick starter, I think we have a little poll. What are the reasons, what are the main reasons that you ask questions in class? Have a go, fill in your poll, click away. So uh, lots of takers for in checking students have understood instructions. No, no. Check comprehension of texts, yeah, okay. Illicit language or ideas from students seems to be going top. That's good. There are a couple of moments more. Oh, this is exciting. Uh, no, 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 no for others, okay. So there we go, 52% going for illicit uh, language or ideas from students, which it's a, a great result because I think hopefully what we will see during the course of this talk is that's very much where I'm coming from, that we want to be thinking about questions which will provide, generate language. They might not be exactly the same kind of questions as you ask. Let's find out. Okay, so these are the ideas we have. There's a couple of other ones which I've got um, uh, suggested here. Uh, one is chat, basically, you know, just talking to students. The questions we ask at the beginning of a class. Um, maybe we ask uh, uh, questions which just to generate some kind of speaking fluency practice. Input, I mean by actually teaching them questions, teaching questions which the students might use, and. Um, then practicing language, maybe questions to generate particular uh, things which we've taught. And then the last one is a uh, student question, the questions students ask us. Okay, now um, there has actually been quite a bit of uh, research into questions and there's some kind of debate over time uh, has taken place within English language teaching. and. Slightly in the way of academics, they have created two names for these types of questions, which perhaps are not the most clear that they could be. The first idea were display questions. The idea here is these are questions we ask where the teacher knows the answer, and they tend to follow this kind of pattern of initiation, response, evaluation. So it's basically initiation, what's the past of go. Student says went. Teacher says good, excellent, well done. The other one is referential questions. This is the rather, I'm not quite sure why they have to choose this particular name, but this is the, 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 the word which was used. And it basically means genuine questions, questions you ask where the teacher doesn't know the answer and has a genuine reason to ask the students or will receive an answer which may be unexpected. So if we just go to our, uh, back to those kind of list of things here, again, we've got a little poll. Of these ones which we've talked about so far, 
which ones would you say are display questions, which ones are referential, you know, which ones are genuine questions. Have a go. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Liking these ideas. Okay. We are getting near there. There we go. All right. Well, um, certainly, yes, as most people say, is 79% going for the instruction. They're displayed questions. Um, these are what I would say. So uh, these are the ones that I came up with. So uh, if we just remove the poll a moment. Thank you. Uh, these are the ones that I would say are generally displayed questions. So uh, the, the top four... Basically, often when we're eliciting language, we, we kind of know what we want. This is why I have it as a display. Similarly, when we have a concept checking question, so went, is it now or the past, for example, we know the answer. However, one of the things we're going to look at is maybe it's not quite as black and white as we say here. The other ones, as several people pointed out, interesting, I re re return to the, I noticed some people had student questions being display questions, which I'll, I'll return to. Um, but generally, these ones, these chat, speaking, yeah, they're, they're, they're questions which we generally don't know the answer, and, um, and we're expecting they're genuine, generally. Okay, why is this important? Well, um, there's two uh, people who are quite important in this discussion. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is actually uh, Long, uh, who is an ELT methodologist and writer. He has um, uh, basically developed the idea of task-based learning. He was a big kind of, um, uh, is a big uh, uh, academic in that area. And he did quite a lot of research onto this idea of um, uh, referential and display questions and basically found that in classes there was a lot of display questions okay uh, and why was that a problem well his theory of language part of it uh, this idea of task-based learning is that learning happens when there is a genuine interaction and there's a breakdown in communication so the idea is essentially if you're just asking these display questions, one is that the students are not getting uh, a model of genuine conversation, genuine kind of interactions. And the second is that there isn't the same kind of breakdown in communication where they have to talk to each other, negotiate meaning and learn and from that learn some new language. Okay. The second guy is actually not to do, is uh, Hattie, John Hattie, uh, is not in ELT. He's a more general um, theorist about education. He's done a big um, surveys of other research into education. They're called meta-analyses. So you basically study all the, the research which has been done, you put them all together, you do some calculations to try and work out what was um, the most effective in class and the least effective. Now, there is some dispute about his research. I won't say that it's, uh, it's, it's perfect, but his kind of central idea was that what really matters in the classroom is feedback. Now, the important thing is it's not the, this feedback of evaluation, well done, it's the feedback of that you get from students, okay? Uh, so the questions need to be more kind of open, I suppose, to get this feedback. 
one of the things which happens sometimes, and this was a thing, I don't know if it's a true story or not, but it is reported in some of the, the questions on, on these, is that sometimes dis, uh, questions which appear genuine, such as, you know, uh, you go around and you go, uh, oh, what does your father do? He's a teacher. Very good. Uh, what does your father do? Oh, he's, uh, he's a teacher. Well done. Okay, great. What does your father do? He's a, he's a policeman. Oh, great. What does your father do? He's dead. Oh, good. It's, it's, it's not becomes a kind of thing. It's a joke. I don't know if it's true or not. It, apparently it was. Um, where they, 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 the genuine question to find out about information is really just a, a way to practice grammar. So the question is then, um, how much feedback do these display questions provide? How do they lead to extending that learning? So this is the idea of Hattie, that you get feedback from the students, you see where their level they're at, and therefore you can then <coughs> teach them new language. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, as, as our students do, they go for the middle round, just in case, perhaps. Yeah, some, some feedback, okay, maybe the, is the, the one we have. Okay, let's, let's have a look at some possible display questions and think about the feedback they give. Now, in this section, I'm going to show you some nonsense language to get you in the feel of what it is for the students. Okay, so here we go. Here's a nonsense language and a display concept checking question. Okay, here we go. Uh, oh, sorry. Sa'ai no kursa i ni la say nothing. So, am I talking about now, the past, or the future? Any, any suggestions there? Who go for that? Any, anybody like to, to get ahead? A few, few typing, frenzied typing. Now, 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 now. Sorry, it's it's the future. There you go. Clear now, students. Uh, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I I I I know. So I know. Kusa. I nila say nothing. So it's about the future. You see. Okay. Everybody clear on that. So, well, obviously, uh, what I have gathered here is that uh, some of you don't know that it's about the future. Some of you maybe do. Do I? Am I certain that the people who do know it's about the future didn't just guess, as I imagine you kind of did, because it's nonsense. The point is that uh, when, I, when I actually learned uh, concept checking questions um, in um, when I long many years ago, over 20 years ago, uh, I did my CELTA course and there was a kind of style, you set up a whole kind of scenario, you presented a, a, a situation, you, you set it up, you kind of elicited language from the students, then you presented the, the actually correct version and then you asked your questions like, is it now or the future? Because it was kind of explained within the, the context you'd set up. And that is the, the key thing, that you need a full context to be able to understand the questions in the first place. You kind of actually need to have an explanation or some kind of previous knowledge of the language for the questions to work. And you need a concept, which I'll return to in uh, when we come to vocabulary. The concept being past or future, real or unreal, those kinds of things. Okay. So it's not to say that these are bad things to ask. Um, 
and in fact you know we have them in our, our our books so we have a little you can see here there's a little kind of very brief explanation we kind of have sentences which were in context which they've heard in the listening and then we ask some questions they're kind of concept questions to check how far students have understood that language we will get some feedback from this it's 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 true the question is kind of firstly how much feedback you get uh, are there other ways we can check individual students or just or the students we hear um, in our class have understood them. And then actually there is a question of how far we can extend the students learning based on that feedback. I personally think that the feedback questions, they offer a little feedback. They give us a general idea of basically a, a some kind of understanding where the students are at. But for me, uh, I know uh, I don't know if any of you have done a CELTA course or those kind of um, initial teacher training where concept questions are often kind of given as a, a central part of the teaching. For me, they're, they're a small part. The, the way I get most feedback about what students understand or don't understand about grammar is from doing the exercises in the book, the gap fills, the controlled practice, general freer practice where they're using language which I've supposed, you know, I've tried to teach, but also just generally any moment when they're trying to speak and communicate in genuine ways. This is the where I get the feedback on what they understand about grammar. The issue about the extending learning, just briefly, is is there is a there are theories. Uh, this guy uh, Pineman was uh, the main kind of driver of these ideas, which is that there is a kind of learnability process that you can't actually learn some structures before you've you've acquired some lower level ones until you're basically ready to take on these new structures. So there is a question about whether we should, okay, what we do with the feedback we get. Maybe it shouldn't necessarily be lots more exercises. Perhaps we should just notice that they're not quite ready for that at this point and move on, let them communicate as best they can and work with what they're, they're using. Okay. What about uh, Lexis. So again, what we're going to look at are some uh, nonsense words uh, and some concept questions in the same idea. So to schlock, does this mean I eat or drink a lot or a little? Any suggestions? A lot. Yes, it's funny this because when I, I invented this word, uh, there must be something in the sound of it which makes it it sound a lot. And you are absolutely right, it is a lot. Does it mean I do it in a short time? Yes, yeah, okay, good, yeah. So what is the word in English? Any suggestions? Gulp. Devour. Swallow, uh, scoff that, scoff down, scarf down. Yeah. Okay. I mean, basically, consume. Yeah, scoff, unlock, swallow. I mean, all these are reasonable suggestions. Uh, they're actually none of the ones. <laughs> Ah, oh, once binge. There we go. The first one. Well done, Mister or Yevhenny Kleider. Okay, binge is the correct answer. Um, the quite the point is though that binge isn't isn't really the same as as gulp. You couldn't use. They're not synonyms. Uh, and this is an initial problem. Okay, which we might want to think about. Um, here's another example. Perhaps we need to give a little bit more context. Okay, so I was driving too quickly, a policeman stopped me, I had to try to catch, 
Tradocrat. Uh, did I give the policeman money? Any answers to that one? Yes, no. Okay, so here, a bit of uncertainty. Maybe um, give a bribe is uh, depends on your country. Yes, well, I'll come to this again. Maybe if I give a, a little bit more context, it will help. I was driving too quickly. A policeman stopped me. I had to trad a crat of 80 euro. Any, any thoughts? Does it mean I gave the policeman money? Okay, here we're having pay a fine. Yeah, fine. Okay. Yeah, possibly. Yes, the policeman. Okay, but here again, some people suggesting a bribe might be a possibility. And that is the point. I mean, I was thinking of the word fine, pay a fine. So there is something that we can teach them. But there's a question, somebody said it depends on the country. And yet that, it's possible that you are paying a fine and you're paying it to the policeman and it's not a bribe. It's a possibility in some countries. Uh, the question is, you know, it's maybe not as clear as it could be. Okay. Part of the, uh, it, we could, I mean, obviously here we haven't given the, the answer. We haven't given the meaning. We haven't given that explanation, which we said was important. So we could give the information. So here is another possibility. You know, go Hosky means to go on strike. So then we can ask the question. So if I go Hosky, are you happy or unhappy about your job? Do you go to work? Is it a holiday? Do you get paid? Do you want something about your job to change? Now, um, these were the kind of questions which, again, I was recommended to ask on my CELTA course. What I found sometimes is the students are slightly confused why, you're, uh, why I was asking such questions. Because I just told them that go Hosky means to go on strike. So they know the meaning. So why are you asking me whether I'm unhappy or unhappy about my job? It's obvious. I'm on strike. Uh, so it can get a little bit silly. I, I, I've done this talk a number of times. And one person was telling me about uh, they'd had to ask questions like this about helmet. And they'd ended up saying uh, things like, do you wear your helmet on your feet? And you, you get into a kind of craziness about it, of trying to focus entirely on meaning rather than usage, which is the thing we're going to look at uh, next. Here are some other possible questions in a moment. The, the point is, how much, again, feedback do these questions give? Even though they may work to some degree, they do check meaning. How much more information do they give us about how these words are used? How can we extend what students know based on the feedback we get from these questions? I would suggest not enough would be my feeling. So here are some possible alternative questions. Again, just type in some possible answers. OK. Have you ever gone Hosky? Yes, no, no, never, yes, no, no, okay. There we go. Who's Hosky now? Not me. <laughs> Train drivers, okay. Not sure, not me, okay. Right, what about... Uh, this one. What, why might people go Hosky? Uh, are they happy about their job? Um, fight for some rights? Low salary? For more pay? Unhappy about work conditions? Plenty of reasons. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we might work with the students here about what they do. Imagine what the students might say. Would they be able to come up with these exact words? 
um, you know, like demotivated pensions, what might they be, um, be talking about? What about these ones? What do you have to do to Hosky? So how does the Hosky start? Well, what's the process? Um, be in a union, okay. You don't go to work, okay. Um, just go and stand in front of your place of work, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, wear a special oh, sing cloth. Yes, I mean we have to have uh, in England. There's, uh, you know, you have to have your kind of things on the outside to show you're part of the union. Before that, you might need a vote. Um, you know, the, the rules are quite strict now in England. How does it end? Any suggestions? Riots. <laughs> oh dear. Badly, yes. Um, yeah. Compromise on both sides. Yes, that's the uh, that's the hopeful hopeful one. Uh, you give in. Employer gives in. That's that's what we really hope for, I suppose. Uh, yes, great victory. Okay, now just for a moment, which of those four questions generated most feedback? And imagine from the the students, and in and why? Why do you think that was? Okay, yeah, I mean, it's basically these kind of open-ended ones. So just to kind of recap, in a way, the, the problem with the traditional concept questions where we're just got these kind of closed ones is they're not really designed for vocabulary because with vocabulary, there's not a, a, a concept as such. The, 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 there's meaning which is very com complex. So, you know, what is the difference between gulp and binge is quite difficult to reduce to questions about yes, no questions. The meaning is basically it's slippery and there can be these kind of cultural problems um, where we're looking about this kind of, you know, does the policeman get the money? Is that a fine or is it a bribe? You know, how does that, that work? With the ones we had, what I was, want to suggest is that actually the principle behind this is that the meaning, we want to give the meaning as quickly as possible. I would recommend, as we did with Hosky, of just giving a translation. So we give a quick translation and then we ask these kinds of open questions in English which generate English, they may generate sometimes your home language because the students don't know the word, but because they don't know the word, this is the feedback you are getting to help them say what they want to say. So this is how you find out whether they know. And these good questions, they usually include the word, so the traditional ones they wouldn't do. The key one is their impersonal. So if you remember the, have you been Hosky? Who's Hosky now? They tend to say just no or yes. Um, now you can ask follow-up questions, but I would suggest that these are better as uh, practice questions rather than to explore the meaning, which is what we really want to, meaning and usage that we want to do first. They explore what it is to know the word and how you use the word. It's not just the simple meaning. They're open. They generate this connected language. And they may have an unexpected answers. So, I mean, there was the thing about the signs, you know, the clothes you wear. Um, uh, I mean, that's that's not new. That's, that may be, is, you know, is probably correct in your context. Uh, I mean, it is correct, obviously, in your context. But, you know, I don't know it. That's not my context. And we can have a little discussion about that. So it actually kind of creates a certain amount of dialogue within the classroom, which is quite energetic and vibrant and involves the students in their learning. And it provides this, ex this information about what they know and what they don't know about these words and how they're used. And that's what we can then fill in 
as we're answering them uh, to these questions. So these are the kind of ones we want, might want to go. Why might people go Hosky? So is this might that uh, is the key thing here? So here are some other uh, possibilities um, that we might ask. They're just a general uh, selection. What you can use are these frames. Uh, so the what other things can you uh, play if you're very at a very low level? Uh, what other things can you um, watch on TV? You know, um, the, the they're basically looking at collocation. Okay, so the things you binge on in this case would be okay, drink, but it also credit cards. Uh, shopping, uh, box TV box sets. Um, in my case, yes, uh, I like this idea of this. Somebody's just mentioned here, Monica, about the critical thinking. I am actually doing a talk recently, uh, soon about critical thinking. It is very much that idea of of getting students to think critically about the language they're learning, which I I like. What's the opposite of leave halfway through? Obviously, is looking at opposites because these are often used within the same conversation so you know you can imagine the conversation at the conference or perhaps after this uh, this um, uh, webinar you go I oh, said so, uh, did you did you watch all of it no I left halfway through okay did you watch all of it uh, what about you yes I stayed till the bitter end hopefully it's not too bitter uh, but you can, you know, you, you can elicit some of these kinds of ideas. So we're familiar with asking what's the opposite of heavy, for example. But perhaps we want to, I, I always, with opposites, I like to ask a combination of words. So what's the opposite of heavy traffic, for example? Uh, what's the opposite of, um, I don't know, a lovely day instead of just lovely? Okay. Uh, what do people do if they're angry? We're looking at kind of usage again in conversation. Oh, she gave me the silent treatment. Uh, she was screaming and shouting. He was screaming and shouting. Uh, you know, he tried to hit me. I don't know. Uh, these kinds of ideas. Um, we can ask questions. Uh, what might you say if you were pleased? I mean, actually, this is quite easy. Oh, I'm really pleased. Oh, I'm really happy. So we could look at about how these were, how the the conversation works. Um, why might you ask if something's boiling? Um, it's it's thinking about what is the pragmatic use. Well, at, why are we using this word boiling? Why would we say it? Uh, well, usually because we want somebody to turn on the air conditioning. You get the idea. We can ask closed ones as well, like what grammar ones, like what pre preposition follows interested. Uh, what verb form follows avoid? These are also helpful questions. We don't want to dismiss them completely, uh, but they're focused on how the word is used. And then you imagine if you're going to practice some of this language, the language you've elicited through these questions is often the language the students will need to talk about it themselves. So, I mean, we sometimes use these kinds of questions in our material. To be honest, not I mean, not in most uh, exercises we don't. We just recommend them. You know, there are things that we have learned to do. Uh, and you can take these ideas in the occasional exercises you see them and apply them to any uh, vocab exercise you're doing. So basically, all you do as you go through the answers, you go, so the answer to number one is angry. Well done, yes. We can have the <laughs> that kind of thing. So uh, what do people do if they're angry? And you ask the question, students kind of give their answers. And that's how I would use these questions. So they've done the exercise, they've got the answer, they've got a basic meaning, and what we're doing is exploring how they're used. OK, those are the kind of more display questions. But as we've seen already, they're display questions which are actually a little bit more like these genuine referential questions. They're a kind of crossover. They're certainly providing more feedback. 
what we could look at now is the the more kind of uh, gen genuine questions. Okay, the first thing uh, I remember some people put answering student questions is like a uh, display question, and I think there is. <laughs> I think often we do treat them as such, uh, in that we sometimes think of them. I mean, I've certainly had this in the past in my own experience, and I was kind of told again in my early training to kind of throw the question back to the student. So the student asks the question and is kind of treated as though, well, they know the answer actually. All I need to do is ask them the question back. You know, so what's the past of Go? What do you think is the past of Go? On occasion, we might know that they know and we're just forcing them to it. But I think generally we should treat student questions as genuine and try to answer them in full. And that will encourage them to ask more questions and give feedback. The parallel I would give you is imagine you're in London, you're looking for, a, for a, a, a Trafalgar Square, you come up to me, you say, yeah, uh, uh, excuse me, can you, can you tell me where Trafalgar Square is? And I go, where do you think it is? Or why don't you look it up on Google Maps? Well, obviously, <laughs> because, A, I don't have Google Maps, so I don't know, and that's why I'm asking you. And in a way, that is the same principle for students, I think, that they generally are asking a question for a good reason. And what we want to do is to give them a, a fullish answer as we can. Obviously, I might not know where Trafalgar Square is, and it's perfectly reasonable for us to say, I don't know. It's an essential question, I think, actually, for, for teachers to, to be part of their teaching. I don't know. Uh, I'll find out. I'll see if I, I, I can get an answer to you later. And obviously, then we try and give them the answer. Um, the practice ones, um, I mean, these are, again, they're based on the ones we have. I think it's just we can just ask lots of questions like these. Um, about words which we teach. And they can be a collection of fairly random words. Um, so do you know anyone who has gone? Have you ever? Is binge drinking a problem in your country? Why, why not? Are you avoiding anything at the moment? Do you know any rough areas? Where are they? What do you think? Why do you think they're rough? They're kind of these genuine questions to find out uh, about each other and where they might use some of the, the language we've taught. The, the point about these is, um, again, we're including the key language. They might not actually use the key language in some ways. I don't think that's a problem myself. We're exploring how they use, so that's good. As a teacher, you need to be prepared to teach some of that surrounding language. So you may have elicited some of it through the questions you asked before, but the students may want to say other things which are new. So listen to them help them. I'm sure these are the things you do already, but we, we might be prepared for those things. Think about how you would answer them. We'll help you prepare a bit for those. We want to frame the questions on the student's experience. Uh, so, you know, asking, have you ever gone Hosky to a, a bunch of, stu you know, university students may know, uh, be, be no good. Um, but we can ask, um, you know, do you know anyone who has? So not just going for the have you ever, but remembering, do you know anyone who has? This reference to people that are as well as you, uh, which allows the students to, to answer them. And I would, I would recommend asking a variety of these. Um, what I would say is don't expect them all to be successful. It doesn't matter. You know, sometimes students will not have anything to say about some of the questions you think of. I think it's better to have a few more and stop the task early so they don't get to the end of it than to have too few which they don't have much to say about. Let them find what they're interested in. Let them find uh, what they, they like doing. OK. The next bit is just chat. Um, here we've got um, first day chat. Just a, just a thought. Where, where do you think these this is things which I often teach in my first day 
I often used to get students coming uh, when I was a manager in a school. Um, students would often come at the beginning of the first day and complain that they were they were in the wrong level. They were in too low a level usually was the, the problem. And I think part of the problem was that there was a lot of chats going on for very good reasons. The, the teacher wanted to, students to get to know each other, feel comfortable in the class, that kind of thing. But actually they didn't teach very much. And that's why the students thought they hadn't learned very much, even though they're in the right level. Uh, so one thing I do is I, I really try to push some new language. And these are all things which come from, from uh, things that people said. So the first one, I often teach in Britain. You might want, not want to use this because, you know, it's not relevant to an international context. But, you know, people will often ask, how are you? Or how do you do even? And I point out that we often ask, say, how's it going, actually? And similarly, people sometimes say, thank you. People will ask, can you open the window? And I say, yeah. And they, uh, and they do it. And I, uh, they say, thank you. I sometimes tell them we often say cheers instead of thank you in Britain. So this is the context they're in. It's quite useful for them. Second lot is to do with where you're from. Second, third lot, jobs. Next one is um, uh, free time. OK, and these might be at a kind of pre-intermediate level, you know, sometimes uh, pre-intermediate, intermediate. It's coming from what the students are trying to say. So I don't worry so much about particular level and often just gap these and then elicit what they're trying to say. OK, so taking this idea, um, think about what did you do at the weekend? This typical chat thing we have at the beginning of a class. Um, what language could we teach through this question? Any suggestions? Past tenses, past simple, yep, past simple, past continuous, activities, past events, simple past and events, past tenses. I went sightseeing, yep, variety of activities. Walk with my child, informal vocabulary, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is obviously a major area. However, I think what we could think about is if you think about the question you ask in reply to those activities which you mentioned. So I went shopping, I went to see my gran, I was in bed all weekend, I went to the cinema, I went to wherever place I watched this match, played, so we have the activities. If you think about how the conversation develops in real life and the questions we could ask to follow up these, they will often lead to uh, you know, a whole new area of language which we could exploit and teach. So often what happens is, you know, I might pick up on what a student has said, like I went shopping, and I will ask them, you know, sometimes they've, are, they've had this conversation between themselves. Sometimes it's me and them as, as, as teachers and students. Uh, so I went shopping and I would say, oh, did you get anything nice? And they would give, uh, yeah, I bought this. Um, oh, what do you call it? It's, uh, you know, uh, uh, for your wrists. Yeah, oh, yeah. I say, yeah, yeah, bracelets. Oh, is it that? And you say, yeah, yeah, oh, it looks lovely. And we could have led then I might build that little conversation. Sometimes I might build that conversation on the, the board, write up some of these ideas on the board. And I then just get the students to have all the students then to have a little shopping conversation, starting with what did you do at the weekend? Went shopping. Did you have anything nice? Da, 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 da. OK, and feeding. Maybe I might do that. Uh, one or two times feeding in some language each time, okay, of the things they bought and the things they were trying to say. Um, and actually, this is how quite a lot of our material in outcomes developed from having these kinds of conversations and then seeing how they developed and what the students needed and trying to provide that language within material, not just as a kind of spontaneous thing. So for me, actually, all ch all chat 
all speaking are moments of this kind of learning possibility and I'm always looking out for them and looking at the questions I might ask to force that the students onto that next step within the conversation where they might not know the language they need and I'm getting the feedback to help them with that. Uh, okay, the la we're getting towards the end. Uh, hopefully we'll have five minutes left. This one is just a thing, it came from a, a, a discussion I had with somebody. It was about um, uh, reading text, comprehension text questions. And the, 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 the researcher was, had this idea that the comprehension kind of questions that you ask in books reveal something about your attitude to what texts are for. And I took this idea and thought about what are the questions we teach in books and what do they show about our attitudes to language and learning? And so basically I took, looked at a whole uh, four, three or four different uh, intermediate books and just looked at the questions they taught uh, as within the grammar exercises. So these are just within the grammar exercises. They exclude all other chat. So here is one thing. Uh, it's teaching questions. What does the these kind of examples show about this the, the the writer's attitudes about what they're doing in the text how many people live in Scotland what happened in 1066 well for me I think they sh they show something that they're interested in teaching something about British culture not just the language okay so that is they obviously think that is an important thing to do within uh, within their material Okay. Um, exactly the same content area in terms of the grammar questions. This is from outcomes. And what I hope you see is we're looking at different types of questions, the auxiliaries you need, there's an exercise around this, but what their students are left with are questions which drive conversation. Okay. And uh, in the main part are natural, typical kinds of questions you might ask. Okay, and actually we then look at some of the typical answers as well. Okay, here's another example for, from another book. What do these show? So again, here we're looking at uh, future. So we go, shall I make you a cup of tea? Are you going to university? Shall we eat out tonight? What are you going to wear for the party? Do you think it's going to rain tomorrow? Can we have a paint or a lunch? Is that a phone? Now, I actually quite like those first questions, but the practice ones are are the following ones, which are you seeing a relative this week? Are you having dinner with your family tonight? Are you getting married soon? Are you going out with your brother and sister tonight? Are you going with your nephew? What this shows to me is they have a view of language, which is we teach the grammar, futures, and the grammar rules, and we teach words, in this case, family family words, and we could just put them together to practice. And this is what we result. For me, they result in something slightly weird and something I would never particularly ask myself. So are you going to have a new nephew or niece soon? I just, I just can't think of a, a context where I would ever ask this question. So same principle again you know we look at uh, outcomes these are the ones we teach are you going away in the summer why what about you do you have any plans of the weekend what about you what you think you're seeing are you going away in the summer there's a certain amount of repetition here um, because the questions we ask with the future are quite limited often and it's the replies which is actually where we look at the grammar and practice the grammar. So again, what we're driving at is teach spoken language, things that students might want to use, say, and explore genuine questions in, a, in, a, in effect and how they might respond to them. So, you know, just as a general thought, I mean, course books are often kind of lumped together. They're seen as all the very same. A very similar model but actually when you look at kind of details about them about the grammar that they have 
the words and the models they give, the usage they give, they can be deference. So some might be aimed, led by aims, teach a grammar rule. And some cases, it, like, like in our case, we try to lead by, well, what would you want to say and work backwards from that and help you give you questions, typical questions you might ask, and then some common responses. Some might be focused on functions, some might be more about social interaction, conversation driven or text driven. Again, I would suggest that the, um, uh, the one with the, uh, the culture is more text driven. Okay, we're basically at the end, but here's just a kind of summary, um, some questions for you to think about and to ask of yourself for your own development. Um, if we want to have these kind of genuine questions, focus on communication, for me these are important questions to ask. So we ask, what did I learn about my students today? This is, if, you, if the answer is nothing, then the question, the, the issue may be that we're not asking enough genuine questions and giving enough opportunity for the students to talk about themselves. So ask yourself this question regularly. Think about, is there a way I can bring in more of the students' voice? What did they learn about each other? Are you giving them, again, if, if, they, if they're not giving enough, not much, perhaps it's because they're not getting enough pair work, Again, perhaps we're not giving enough uh, space for them to, to do that. Maybe you're not reporting. I mean, some of the, the reporting of what they say in their, their conversations. What new language did they learn? I mean, is obviously a very important question to ask. But um, it's surprising, you know, often how you can go through a class and not have anything on the board. I used to go send teachers out to look at boards and there would be a blank board. Nothing was taught. Uh, were there any better questions I could have asked? The kinds of questions I've suggested today are, they're not easy to do. You do need practice with doing them. And I often ask rubbish ones, to be frank, which I kind of just can't think at the moment. But sometimes what I'll do is when I've taught that, that new language, I'll think, oh, well, afterwards, I'll think about a question and I'll use that question as a kind of revision the following day or in a later class. So you could basically collect a, a few of these questions as a revision sheet, just give them the sheet to the students to discuss between themselves. Uh, what language did I teach that I haven't before? Again, we get stuck in a kind of a quite narrow way, I think, sometimes. Um, if, you, if, if, if it's nothing I've knew to you as a teacher, then perhaps we're not giving, again, we're not giving enough space for students to diverge and come up with new stuff. Um, what questions did my students ask? If they didn't ask any, okay, that could be a good sign that they're happy. You know, they understand, they follow everything. But for me, I'd like to encourage that dialogue between teachers and students. I think it's I worry slightly when students don't ask any questions at all. Uh, did I answer them well? Could it have been better? I mean, that's, again, I very frequently give, I mean, you know, well, not very frequently perhaps, but, you know, I give poor answers from time to time, uh, especially when it's a new question, which I hadn't thought about before. It's just normal. And I just say, oh, I don't know, or I give a, do my best, I struggle a bit, and then come back to it. Uh, and then the last thing is just, as a recommendation, why not try and write some material based on these language or stuff which has come up in class? For me, always, I recommend, you know, I, I love people to use our course books and I want you to enjoy them. But for me, I've, I've gained so much as a teacher from writing material that I would always recommend that uh, you do as well. And that is the end of our webinar. Um, Thank you so much for coming. I think we might have five minutes for quick questions. Uh, there are um, some further information. Uh, you, you will actually get the PowerPoint from Emily uh, through, a, I think she'll email the PowerPoint and the link to the slides and everything. 
Uh, we do have, um, uh, a, say, a summer school, so do focus on our, have a look on our website, lexicallab.com, and of course, check out um, um, Outcomes, which is, uh, is here, and very much hope that you will visit um, one of our National Geographic Learning webinars again in the future, and I hope you enjoyed this one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you everyone for coming. I hope you enjoyed you know, some of the ideas and have something new to bring to your classroom that you learned today. Um, just a few closing remarks. We'd love for you to join another webinar. Um, you can check out our upcoming ones on the website here, ngl.cengage.com slash webinars. And then we also do have a blog for teaching English tips, and that's ngl.cengage.com slash infocus. Um, so you will be emailed within five days the certificate of attendance, which is also available here, the recording of the webinar, and then also the slides. So stay tuned for that. We hope you can join us in the future. Um, and just the last note, we do have a survey that you'll be directed to after this webinar. So we'd love to hear your feedback to help us inform webinars in the future. Thank you so much, Andrew. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Everyone. And thank have a good night. Else for staying up so late. It's been uh, really good to, to talk to you. Thank you. All right.